the Hermetic Arcanum. To the students in, and well affected unto Hermetic philosophy, health and prosperity. Amongst the heights of hidden philosophy, the production of the Hermetic Stone hath of a long time been strongly believed to be the chiefest, and nearest a miracle, both for the labyrinths and multitudes of operations, out of which the mind of man, unless it be illuminated by a beam of divine light, is not able to unwind herself, as also because of its most noble end which promiseth a constant plenty of health and fortunes, the two main pillars of an happy life. Besides, the chief promoters of this science have made it most remote from the knowledge of the vulgar sort by their tropes and dark expressions, and have placed it on high, as a tower impregnable for rocks and situation where unto where can be no access, unless God direct the way. The study of hiding this art hath drawn a reproach upon the art itself and its professors, for when those unfortunate plunderers of the golden fleece by reason of their unskillfulness felt themselves, beat down from their vain attempt, and far unequal unto such eminent persons, they in a furious rapture of desperation, like madmen, waxed hot against their fame and the renown of the science, utterly denying anything to be above their cognizance, and the sphere of their wit. But what was foolish and frothy, and because they set upon a business of damage to themselves, they have not ceased to accuse the chief masters of hidden philosophy of falsehood, nature of impotency and art of cheats, not for any other reason, then that they rashly condemn what they know not, nor is this condemnation a sufficient revenge, without the addition of madness to snarl and bite the innocent with infamous flounders. I grieve, in truth, for their hard fortune, who whilst they reprove others, give occasion of their own conviction, although they justly suffer an hellish fury within them. They moil and swear to Bartus the obscure principles of the most hidden philosophy with troops' arguments, and to pull up the secret foundations thereof with their devised engines, which yet are only manifest to the skillful, and those that are much versed in so sublime philosophy, but lit from strangers, nor do these quick-fighted senses observe, that whilst they malign another's credit, they willingly betray their own. Let them consider with themselves, whether they understand those things which they carpet, what author of eminency hath divulged, the secret elements of this science, the labyrinths and windings of operations, and lastly, the whole proceed therein. What Oedipus hath sincerely, and truly explained done to him the figures and entangled dark speeches of authors. With what oracle, what sibyl, have they been led into the sanctuary of this holy science? In fine, how were all things in it made so manifest, that no part remains yet unveiled? I suppose they will no otherwise answer my question, than thus, that they have pierced all things by the subtlety of their wits, or confess that they were taught, or rather seduced, by some wandering quack or mountebank, who hath crept into good esteem with them, by his feigned countenance of a philosopher. O oh, wickedness! Who can silently suffer these palmer worms to gnaw upon the fame, labor, and glory of the wise? Who can with patience hear blind men, as cut of a tree pod judging of the sun? But it is greater glory to contemn the hurtless darts of babblers, than to repel them. Let them only disdain the treasure of nature and art, who cannot obtain it. Nor is it my purpose to plead the doubtful cause of an unfortunate science, and being condemned, to take it into tuition, our guiltless philosophy is no whit criminous, and standing firm by thy aid of eminentest authors, and fortified with the manifold experience of divers ages, it remains safe enough from the fopperies of prattlers, and the snarlings of envy. However charity hath incited me, and the multitude of wanderers induced me, taking pity on them, to present my light, that to they may escape the hazard of the night. By help whereof they may only live out, but also procure an enlargement both to their life and fading fortunes. This small treatise penned for your use, ye students of hermetic philosophy, I present unto you, that it may be dedicated to those, for whose sake it was writ. If any perhaps shall complain of me, and summon me to appear as guilty of breach of silence for divulging secrets in an itching style, ye have one guilty of too much respectfulness towards you, confessing his fault, sentence him if you please, so that my crime may supply the place of a reward to you, the offence will not be displeasing unto you, and the punishment, I doubt not, pleasant unto me, if I shall find myself to have erred in this only, 
whereby you may put an end to erring for the future. The secret work of the Hermetic philosophy, wherein the secrets of nature and art concerning the matter of the philosopher's stone and the manner of working are explained in an authentic and orderly manner. The work of an anonymous author, Haines knows under Taji. 1. The beginning of this divine science is the fear of the Lord and its end is charity and love toward our neighbor, the all-satisfying golden crop is properly devoted to the rearing and endowing of temples and hospices, for whatsoever the Almighty freely bestoweth on us, we should properly offer again to him. So also countries grievously oppressed may be set free, prisoners unduly held captive may be released, and souls almost starved may be relieved. 2. The light of this knowledge is the gift of God, which by his will he bestoweth upon whom he pleaseth. Let none therefore set himself to the study hereof, until having cleared and purified his heart, he devote himself wholly unto God, and be emptied of all affection and desire unto the impure things of this world. 3. The science of producing nature's grand secret, is a perfect knowledge of universal nature and of art concerning the realm of metals, the practice thereof is conversant with finding the principles of metals by analysis, and after they have been made much more perfect, to conjoin them otherwise than they have been before, that from thence may result a Catholic medicine, most powerful to perfect imperfect metals, and for restoring sick and decayed bodies, of any sort soever. 4. Those that hold public honors and offices or be always busied with private and necessary occupations, let them not strive to attain unto the acme of this philosophy, for it requireth the whole man's, and being found, it possesseth him, and he being possessed, it debarreth him from all other long and serious employments, for he will esteem other things as strange, and of no value unto him. 5. Let him that is desirous of this knowledge, clear his mind from all evil passions, especially pride, which is an abomination to heaven, and is as the gate of hell, let him be frequent in prayer and charitable, have little to do with the world, abstain from company keeping, enjoy constant tranquility, that the mind may be able to reason more freely in private and be highly lifted up, for unless it be kindled with a beam of divine light, it will not be able to penetrate these hidden mysteries of truth. 6. The alchemists who have given their minds to their well-nigh innumerable sublimations, distillations, solutions, congelations, to manifold extraction of spirits and tinctures, and other operations more subtle than profitable, and so have distracted themselves by a variety of errors, as so many tormentors, will never be inclined again by their own genius to the plain way of nature and light of truth, from whence their industrious subtlety hath twined them, and by twinings and turnings, as by the Libyan quicksands, hath drowned their entangled wits, the only hope of safety for them remaineth in finding out a faithful guide and master, who may make the sun clear and conspicuous unto them and free themselves from darkness. 7. A studious tire of a quick wit, constant mind, inflamed with the study of philosophy, very skillful in natural philosophy, of a pure heart, complete in manners, mightily devoted to God, though ignorant of practical chemistry, may with confidence enter into the highway of nature and peruse the books of the best philosophers, let him seek out an ingenious and sedulous companion for himself, and not despair of obtaining his desire. 8. Let a student of these secrets carefully beware of reading or keeping company with false philosophers, for nothing is more dangerous to a learner of any science, than the company of an unskilled or deceitful man by whom erroneous principles are stamped as true whereby a simple and credulous mind is seasoned with false doctrine. 9. Let a lover of truth make use of few authors, but of the best note and experienced truth, let him suspect things that are quickly understood, especially in mystical names and secret operations, for truth lies hid in obscurity, for philosophers never write more deceitfully, than when plainly, nor ever more truly, than when obscurely. 10. As for the authors of chiefest note, who have discoursed both acutely and truly of the secrets of nature and hidden philosophy, Hermes and Morienus Romanus amongst the ancients are in my judgment of the highest esteem, amongst the moderns, Count Trevisan, and Raymondus Lullius are in greatest reverence with me, for what that most acute doctor hath omitted, none almost hath spoken, let a student therefore peruse his works, 
yea let him often read over his former testament, and codicil, and accept them as a legacy of very great worth. To these two volumes let him add both his volumes of practice, out of which works all things desirable may be collected, especially the truth of the first matter, of the degrees of fire, and the regimen of the whole, wherein the final work is finished, and those things which our ancestors so carefully labored to keep secret. The occult causes of things, and the secret motions of nature are demonstrated nowhere more clearly and faithfully. Concerning the first and mystical water of the philosophers he hath set down few things, yet very pithily. 11. As for that clear water sought for by many, found by so few, yet obvious and profitable unto all, which is the basis of the philosopher's work, a noble Pole, not more famous for his learning than subtlety of wit, who wrote anonymously, but whose name notwithstanding a double anagram hath betrayed, hath in his Novum Lumen Chimicum, Parabola, and Enigma, as also in his tract on Sulphur, spoken largely and freely enough, yea he hath expressed all things concerning it so plainly, that nothing can be more satisfactory to him, that desireth knowledge. 12. Philosophers do usually express themselves more pithily in types and enigmatical figures, as by a mute kind of speech, than by words, see for example, Senior's table, the allegorical pictures of Rosarius, the pictures of Abraham Judaeus in Flamel, and the drawings of Flamel himself, of the later sort, the rare emblems of the most learned Michael Mayerus wherein the mysteries of the ancients are so fully opened, and as new perspectives they present antiquated truth. And though designed remote from our age yet are near unto our eyes, and are perfectly to be perceived by us. 13. Whosoever affirmeth that the philosopher's grand secret is beyond the powers of nature and art, he is blind because he ignores the forces of Sol and Luna. 14. As for the matter of their hidden stone, philosophers have written diversely, so that very many disagreeing in words, do nevertheless very well agree in the thing, nor doth their different speech argue the science ambiguous or false, since the same thing may be expressed with many tongues, by divers expressions, and by a different character, and also one and many things may be spoken of after diverse manners. 15. Let the studious reader have a care of the manifold significations of words, for by deceitful windings, and doubtful, yea contrary speeches, as it should seem, philosophers wrote their mysteries, with a desire of veiling and hiding, yet not of sophisticating or destroying the truth, and though their writings abound with ambiguous and equivocal words, yet about none do they more contend than in hiding their golden branch, which all the groves with shadows overcast, and gloomy valleys hide. Nor yieldeth it to any force, but readily and willingly will follow him, who knows Dame Venus birds and him to whom of doves a lucky pair sent from above shall hover about his ear. 16. Whosoever seeketh the art of perfecting and multiplying imperfect metals, beyond the nature of metals, goes in error, for from metals the metals are to be derived, even as from man, mankind, and from an ox only, is that species to be obtained. 17. Metals, we must confess, cannot be multiplied by the instinct and labor of nature only, yet we may affirm that the multiplying virtue is hid in their depths, and manifested itself by the help of art, in this work, nature standeth in need of the aid of art, and both do make a perfect whole. 18. Perfect bodies as Sol and Luna are endued with a perfect seed, and therefore under the hard crust of the perfect metals the perfect seed lies hid, and he that knows how to take it out by the philosopher's solution, hath entered upon the royal highway for. In gold the seeds of gold do lie, though buried in obscurity. 19. Most philosophers have affirmed that their kingly work is wholly composed of Sol and Luna, others have thought good to add Mercury to Sol, some have chosen Sulphur and Mercury, others have attributed no small part in so great a work to salt mingled with the other two. The very same men have professed that this clear stone is made of one thing only, sometimes of two, or of three, at other times of four, and of five, and yet though writing so variously upon the same subject, they do nevertheless agree in sense and meaning. 20. Now that, abandoning all blinds we may write candidly and truly, 
We hold that this entire work is perfected by two bodies only, to wit, by Sol and Lua rightly prepared, for this is the mere generation which is by nature, with the help of art, wherein the union of male and female doth take place, and from thence an offspring far more noble than the parents is brought forth. 21. Now those bodies must be taken, which are of an unspotted and incorrupt virginity, such as have life and spirit in them, not extinct as those that are handled by the vulgar, for who can expect life from dead things, and those are called impure which have suffered combination, those dead and extinct which, by the enforcement of the chief tyrant of the world, have poured out their soul with their blood by martyrdom, flee then a fratricide from which the most imminent danger in the whole work is threatened. 22. Now Sol is masculine for as much as he sendeth forth active and energizing seed, Lule is feminine or negative and she is called the matrix of nature, because she receiveth the sperm, and fostereth it by monthly provision, yet doth Lula not altogether want in positive or active virtue. 23. By the name of Lula philosophers understand not the vulgar moon, which also may be positive in its operation, and in combining acts a positive part. Let none therefore presume to try the unnatural combination of two positives, neither let him conceive any hope of issue from such association, but he shall join Gabricius to Beer, and offer sister to brother in firm union, that from thence he may receive Saul's noble son. 24. They that hold sulphur and mercury to be the first matter of the stone, by the name of sulphur they understand Sol, by mercury the philosophic lunar, so, without dissimulation, good Lullius adviseth his friend, that he attempt not to work without mercury and lunar for silver, nor without mercury and sulphur gold. 25. Let none therefore be deceived by adding a third to two, for love admitteth not a third, and wedlock is terminated in the number of two, love further extended is not matrimony. 26. Nevertheless, spiritual love polluteth not any virgin, be a might therefore without fault, before her betrothal to Gabricius, have felt spiritual love, to the end that she might thereby be made more cheerful, more pure and fitter for union. 27. Procreation is the end of lawful wedlock. Now that the progeny may be born more vigorous and active, let both the combatants be cleansed from every ill and spot, before they are united in marriage. Let nothing superfluous cleave unto them, because from pure seed comes a purified generation, and so the chaste wedlock of Sol and Luna shall be finished when they shall enter into combination, and be conjoined, and Luna shall receive a soul from her husband by this union, from this conjunction a most potent king shall arise, whose rather will be Sol and his mother Luna. 28. He that seeks for a physical tincture without Sol and Luna, loseth both his cost and pains, for Sol afforded a most plentiful tincture of redness, and Luna of whiteness, for these two only are called perfect, because they are filled with the substance of purest sulphur, perfectly clarified by the skill of nature. Let thy mercury therefore receive a tincture from one or other of these luminaries, for anything must of necessity possess a tincture before it can tinge other bodies. 29. Perfect metals contain in themselves two things which they are able to communicate to the imperfect metals. Tincture and power of fixation, for pure metals, because they are dyed and fixed with pure sulphur to wit both white and red, do therefore perfectly tincture and fix, if they be fitly prepared with their proper sulphur and arsenic, otherwise they have not strength for multiplying their tincture. 30. Mercury is alone among the imperfect metals, fit to receive the tincture of sol and luna in the work of the philosopher's stone, and being itself full of tincture can tinge other metals in abundance, yet ought it, before that, to be full of invisible sulphur, that it may be the more colored with the visible tincture of perfect bodies, and so repay with sufficient usury. 31. Now the whole tribe of philosophers do much assert and work mightily to extract tincture out of gold, for they believe that tincture can be separated from sol, and being separated increases in virtue but. Vain hope, at last the hungry plowman cheats with empty husks, instead of lusty meats for it is impossible that Sol's tincture can at all be severed from his natural body, since there can be no elementary body made up by nature more perfect than gold, 
the perfection whereof proceedeth from the strong and inseparable union of pure colouring sulphur with mercury, both of them being admirably predisposed thereunto by nature, whose true separation nature denieth unto art. But if any liquor remaining be extracted, by the violence of fire or waters, from the sun, it is to be reputed a part of the body made liquid or dissolved by force. For the tincture followeth its body, and is never separated from it. That is a delusion of this art, which is unknown to many artificers themselves. 32. Nevertheless it may be granted, that tincture may be separable from its body, yet, we must confess, it cannot be separated without the corruption of the tincture, as when artists offer violence to the gold destroying by fire, or use aqua fortis, thus rather corroding than dissolving. The body therefore if despoiled of its tincture and golden fleece, must needs grow base and as an unprofitable heap turn to the damage of its artificer, and the tincture thus corrupted can only have a weaker operation. 33. Let alchemists in the next place cast their tincture into mercury, or into any other imperfect body, and as strongly conjoin both of them as their art will permit, yet shall they fail of their hopes in two ways. First, because the tincture will neither penetrate nor color beyond nature's weight and strength, and therefore no gain will accrue from thence to recompense the expense and countervail the loss of the body spoiled, and thus of no value, so. Want is poor mortal's wages, when his toil produces only loss of pain and oil. Lastly, the debased tincture applied to another body will not give that perfect fixation and permanency required to endure a strong trial, and resist searching Saturn. 34. Let them therefore that are desirous of alchemy, and have hitherto followed impostors and mountebanks, found a retreat, spare no time nor cost, and give their minds to a work truly philosophical, lest the Phrygians be wise too late, and at length be compelled to cry out with the prophet, strangers have devoured his strength. 35. In the philosopher's work more time and toil than cost is expended, for he that hath convenient matter need be at little expense, besides, those that hunt after great store of money, and place their chief end in wealth, they trust more to their riches than their own art. Let, therefore, the too credulous Tyro beware of pilfering pickpockets, for while they promise golden mountains, they lay in wait for gold, they demand bright gold, viz. money beforehand, because they walk in evil and darkness. 36. As those that sail between Scylla and Charybdis are in danger from both sides and to no less hazard art they subject to pursuing the prize of the golden fleece are carried between the uncertain rocks of the sulphur and mercury of the philosophers. The more acute students by their constant reading of grave and credible authors, and by the radiant sunlight, have attained unto the knowledge of sulphur but are at a stand at the entrance of their search for the philosopher's mercury, for writers have twisted it with so many windings and meanderings, involved it with so many equivocal names, that it may be sooner met with by the force of the seeker's intuition, than be found by reason or toil. 37. That philosophers might the deeper hide their mercury in darkness, they have made it manifold, and placed their mercury, yet diversely, in every part and in the forefront of their work, nor will he attain unto a perfect knowledge thereof, who shall be ignorant of any part of the work. 38. Philosophers have acknowledged their mercury to be threefold, to wit, after the absolute preparation of the first degree, the philosophical sublimation, for then they call it their mercury, and mercury sublimated. 39. Again, in the second preparation, that which by authors is styled the first, because they omit the first, Sol being now made crude again, and resolved into his first matter, is called the mercury of such like bodies, or the philosopher's mercury, then the matter is called rebes, chaos, or the whole world, wherein are all things necessary to the work, because that only is sufficient to perfect the stone. 40. Thirdly, the philosophers do sometimes call perfect elixir and colouring medicine, their mercury, though improperly, for the name of mercury doth only properly agree with that which is volatile, besides that which is sublimated in every region of the work, they call mercury, but elixir, that which is most fixed cannot have the simple name of mercury, and therefore they have styled it their mercury to differentiate it from that which is volatile. 
A straight may is only laid down for some to find out and discern so many mercuries of the philosophers, for those only. Whom just and mighty Jove advanceth by the strength of love, or such who brave heroic fire, makes from dull earth to heaven aspire. 41. The elixir is called the philosopher's mercury for the likeness and great conformity it hath with heavenly mercury, for to this, being devoid of elementary qualities, heaven is believed to be most propitious, and that changeable Proteus puts on and increaseth the genius and nature of other planets, by reason of opposition, conjunction, and aspect. In like manner this uncertain elixir worketh, for being restricted to no proper quality, it embraceth the quality and disposition of the thing wherewith it is mixed, and wonderfully multiplieth the virtues and qualities thereof. 42. In the philosophical sublimation or first preparation of mercury, Herculean labor must be undergone by the workman, for Jason had in vain attempted his expedition to Colchos without Alcides. One from on high a golden fleece displays which shows the entrance, another says how hard a task you'll find. For the entrance is warded by horned beasts which drive away those that approach rashly thereunto, to their great hurt, only the ensigns of Diana and the doves of Venus are able to assuage their fierceness, if the fates favor the attempt. 43. The natural quality of philosophical earth and the tillage thereof, seems to be touched upon by the poet in this verse. Let sturdy oxen when the year begins plough up the fertile soil, for Zephyrus then destroys the sodden clods. 44. He that calleth the philosophers lunar or their mercury, the common mercury, doth wittingly deceive, or is deceived himself, so the writings of Gebert teach us, that the philosophers mercury is argent vive, yet not of the common sort, but extracted out of it by the philosopher's skill. 45. The philosopher's mercury is not argent vive in its proper nature, nor in its whole substance, but is only the middle and pure substance thereof, which thence hath taken its origin and has been made by it. This opinion of the grand philosophers is founded on experience. 46. The philosopher's mercury hath divers names, sometimes it is called earth, sometimes water, when viewed from a diverse aspect, because it naturally ariseth from them both. The earth is subtle, white and sulphurous, in which the elements are fixed and the philosophical gold is sown, the water is the water of life, learning permanent, most clear, called the water of gold and silver, but this mercury, because it hath in it sulphur of its own, which is multiplied by art, deserves to be called the sulphur of argent vive. Last of all, the most precious substance is Venus, the ancient hermaphrodite, glorious in its double sex. 47. This argent vive is partly natural, partly unnatural, its intrinsic and occult part hath its root in nature, and this cannot be drawn forth unless it be by some precedent cleansing, and industrious sublimation, its extrinsic part is preternatural and accidental. Separate, therefore, the clean from the unclean, the substance from the accidents, and make that which is hid, manifest, by the course of nature, otherwise you make no further progress for this is the foundation of the whole work and of nature. 48. That dry and most precious liquor doth constitute the radical moisture of metals wherefore by some of the ancients it is called glass, for glass is extracted out of the radical moisture closely inherent in ashes which offer resistance, except to the hottest flame notwithstanding our inmost or central mercury discovers itself by the most gentle and kindly, though a little more tedious, fire of nature. 49. Some have sought for the latent philosophical earth by calcination, others by sublimation, many among glass, and some few between vitriol and salt, even as among their natural vessels, others enjoin you to sublime it out of lime and glass. But we have learned of the prophet that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness, etc. Joseph's blessing spoken of by the same prophet will be sufficient to a wise man. Blessed of the Lord be his land, for the apples of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that liveth beneath, for the apples of fruit both of sun and moon, 
for the top of the ancient mountains, for the apples of the everlasting hills, etc., pray the Lord from the bottom of thy heart, my son, that he would bestow upon thee a portion of this blessed earth. 50. Argent vive is so defiled by original sin, that it floweth with a double infection, the first it hath contracted from the polluted earth, which hath mixed itself therewith in the generation of argent vive, and by congelation hath cleaved thereunto, the second borders upon the dropsy and is the corruption of intercuttle water, proceeding from thick and impure water, mixed with the clear, which nature was not able to squeeze out and separate by constriction, but because it is extrinsic. It flies off with a gentle heat. The mercury's leprosy infesting the body, is not of its root and substance, but accidental, and therefore separable from it, the earthly part is wiped off by a warm wet bath and the lava of nature, the watery part is taken away by a dry bath with that gentle fire suitable to generation. And thus by a threefold washing and cleansing the dragon putteth off his old scales and ugly skin is renewed in beauty. 51. The philosophical sublimation of mercury is completed by two processes, namely by removing things superfluous from it, and by introducing things which are wanting. In superfluities are the external accidents, which in the dark sphere of Saturn do make cloudy glittering Jupiter. Separate therefore the leaden color of Saturn which cometh up out of the water until Jupiter's purple star smile upon thee. Adhere unto the sulphur of nature, whose grain and ferment it hath in itself, so much as sufficeth it, but see that it be sufficient for other things also. Multiply therefore that invisible sulphur of the philosophers until the virgin's s milk come forth, and so the first gate is opened unto thee. 52. The entrance of the philosopher's garden is kept by the Hesperian dragon, which being put aside, a fountain of the dearest water proceeding from a sevenfold spring floweth forth on every side of the entrance of the garden, wherein make the dragon drink thrice the magical number of seven, until having drunk he put off his hideous garments, then may the divine powers of light bringing Venus and horned Diana, be propitious unto thee. 53. Three kinds of most beautiful flowers are to be sought, and may he found in this garden of the wise, damask-colored violets, the milk-white lily, and the purple and immortal flower of love, the amaranth. Not far from that fountain at the entrance, fresh violets do first salute thee, which being watered by streams from the great golden river, they put on the most delicate color of the dark sapphire, then Sol will give thee a sign. Thou shalt not sever such precious flowers from their roots until thou make the stone, for the fresh ones cropped off have more juice and tincture, and then pick them carefully with a gentle and discreet hand, if the fates frown not, this will easily follow, and one white flower being plucked, the other golden one will not be wanting, let the lily and the amaranth succeed with still greater care and longer labor. 54. Philosophers have their sea also, wherein small fishes plump and shining with silver scales are generated, which he that shall entangle, and take by a fine and small net shall be accounted a most expert fisherman. 55. The philosopher's stone is found in the oldest mountains, and flows from everlasting brooks, those mountains are of silver, and the brooks are even of gold, from thence gold and silver and all the treasures of kings are produced. 56. Whosoever is minded to obtain the philosopher's stone, let him resolve to take a long peregrination, for it is necessary that he go to see both the Indies, that from thence he may bring the most precious gems and the purest gold. 57. Philosophers extract their stone out of seven stones, the two chief whereof are of a diverse nature and efficacy, the one infuseth invisible sulphur, the other spiritual mercury, that one induceth heat and dryness, and this one cold and moisture, thus by their help, the strength of the elements is multiplied in the stone, the former is found in the eastern coast, the latter in the western, both of them have the power of coloring and multiplying. And unless the stone shall take its first tincture from them it will neither color nor multiply. 58. Recipe then the winged virgin very well washed and cleansed, impregnated by the spiritual seed of the first male, and fecundated in the permanent glory of her untouched virginity, she will be discovered by her cheeks dyed with a blushing color, join her to the second, 
by whose seed she shall conceive again and shall in time bring forth a reverend offspring of double sex, from whence an immortal race of most potent kings shall gloriously arise. 59. Keep up and couple the eagle and lion well cleansed in their transparent cloister, the entry door being shut and watched lest their breath go out, or the air without do privily get in. The eagle shall snap up and devour the lion in this combination, afterwards being affected with a long sleep, and a dropsy occasioned by a foul stomach, she shall be changed by a wonderful metamorphosis into a coal-black crow, which shall begin to fly with wings stretched out, and by its flight shall bring down Mater from the clouds, until being often moistened, he put off his wings of his own accord, and falling down again he be changed into a most white swan. Those that are ignorant of the causes of things may wonder with astonishment when they consider that the world is nothing but a continual metamorphosis, they may marvel that the seeds of things perfectly digested should end in greatest whiteness. Let the philosopher imitate nature in his work. 60. Nature proceedeth thus in making and perfecting her works, that from an inchoate generation it may bring a thing by divers means, as it were by degrees, to the ultimate term of perfection, she therefore attaineth her end by little and little, not by leaps, confining and including her work between two extremes, distinct and severed as by spaces. The practice of philosophy, which is the imitator of nature, ought not to decline from the way and example of nature in its working and direction to find out its happy stone, for whatsoever is without the bounds of nature is either in error or is near one. 61. The extremes of the stone are natural argent vive and perfect elixir, the middle parts which lie between, by help whereof the work goes on, are of three sorts, for they either belong unto matter, or operations, or demonstrative signs, the whole work is perfected by these extremes and means. 62. The material means of the stone are of divers kinds, for some are extracted out of others successively, the first are mercury philosophically sublimated, and perfect metals, which although they be extreme in the work of nature, yet in the philosophical work they supply the place of means, of the former the seconds are produced, namely the four elements, which again are circulated and fixed of the seconds, the third is produced, to wit, sulphur, the multiplication hereof doth terminate the first work. The fourth and last means are leaven or ointments weighed with the mixture of the things aforesaid, successively produced in the work of the elixir. By the right ordering of the things aforesaid, the perfect elixir is finished, which is the last term of the whole work, wherein the philosopher's stone resteth as in its centre, the multiplication whereof is nothing else than a short repetition of the previous operations. 63. The operative means, which are also called the keys of the work, are four, the first is solution or liquefaction, the second is ablution, the third reduction, the fourth fixation. By liquefaction bodies return into their first form, things concocted are made raw again, and the combination between the position and negative is effected, from whence the crow is generated lastly the stone is divided into four confused elements, which happeneth by the retrogradation of the luminaries. The ablution teacheth how to make the crow white, and to create the Jupiter of Saturn, which is done by the conversion of the body into spirit. The office of reduction is to restore the soul to the stone exanimated, and to nourish it with dew and spiritual milk, until it shall attain unto perfect strength. In both these latter operations the dragon rageth against himself, and by devouring his tail, doth wholly exhaust himself, and at length is turned into the stone. Lastly, the operation of the fixation fixeth both the white and the red sulphurs upon their fixed body, by the mediation of the spiritual tincture, it decocteth the leaven or ferment by degrees ripeneth things unripe, and sweeteneth the bitter. In fine by penetrating and tincturing the flowing elixir it generateth, perfecteth, and lastly, raiseth it up to the height of sublimity. 64. The means or demonstrative signs are colours successively and orderly affecting the matter and its affections and demonstrative passions, whereof there are three special ones, as critical, to be noted, to these some add a fourth. The first is black, which is called the crow's head, because of its extreme blackness whose crepusculum showeth the beginning of the action of the fire of nature and solution, 
and the blackest midnight showeth the perfection of liquefaction, and confusion of the elements. Then the grain putrefies and is corrupted, that it may be the more apt for generation. The white color succeedeth the black wherein is given the perfection of the first degree, and of the white sulfur. This is called the blessed stone, this earth is white and foliated, wherein philosophers do so their gold. The third is orange color, which is produced in the passage of the white to the red, as the middle and being mixed of both is as the dawn with his saffron hair, a forerunner of the sun. The fourth color is ruddy and sanguine, which is extracted from the white fire only. Now because whiteness is easily altered by another color before day it quickly faileth of its candor. But the deep redness of the sun perfecteth the work of sulphur, which is called the sperm of the male, the fire of the stone, the king's crown, and the son of Sol, wherein the first labor of the workman resteth. 65. Besides these decretory signs which firmly inhere in the matter, and show its essential mutations, almost infinite colors appear, and show themselves in vapors, as the rainbow in the clouds, which quickly pass away and are expelled by those that succeed, more affecting the air than the earth, the operator must have a gentle care of them, because they are not permanent, and proceed not from the intrinsic disposition of the matter, but from the fire painting and fashioning everything after its pleasure. Or casually by heat in slight moisture. 66. Of the strange colors, some appearing out of time, give an ill omen to the work, such as the blackness renewed, for the crow's young ones having once left their nest are never to be suffered to return. Too hasty redness, for this once, and in the end only, gives a certain hope of the harvest, if therefore the matter become red too soon it is an argument of the greatest aridity, not without great danger, which can only be averted by heaven alone forthwith bestowing a shower upon it. 67. The stone is exalted by successive digestions, as by degrees, and at length attaineth to perfection. Now four digestions agreeable to the four above said operations or governments to complete the whole work, the author whereof is the fire, which makes the difference between them. 68. The first digestion operateth the solution of the body, whereby comes the first conjunction of male and female, the commixtion of both seeds, putrefactium, the resolution of the elements into homogeneous water, the eclipse of the sun and moon in the head of the dragon, and lastly it bringeth back the whole world into its ancient chaos, and dark abyss. This first digestion is as in the stomach, of a melon color and weak, more fit for corruption than generation. 69. In the second digestion the Spirit of the Lord walketh upon the waters, the light begins to appear, and a separation of waters from the waters occurs, Sol and Luna are renewed, the elements are extracted out of the chaos, that being perfectly mixed in spirit they may constitute a new world, a new heaven and new earth are made, and lastly all bodies become spiritual. The crow's young ones changing their feathers begin to pass into doves, the eagle and lion embrace one another in an eternal league of amity. And this generation of the world is made by the fiery spirit descending in the form of water, and wiping away original sin, for the philosopher's water is fire, which is moved by the exciting heat of a bath. But see that the separation of waters be done in weight and measure, lest those things that remain under heaven be drowned under the earth, or those things that are snatched up above the heaven, be too much destitute of aridity. Here let slight moisture leave a barren soil. 70. The third digestion of the newly generated earth drinketh up the dewy milk, and all the spiritual virtues of the quintessence, and fasteneth the quickening soul to the body by the Spirit's mediation. Then the earth layeth up a great treasure in itself, and is made like the coruscating moon, afterwards like to the ruddy sun, the former is called the earth of the moon, the latter the earth of the sun, for both of them are beget of the copulation of them both, neither of them any longer feareth the pains of the fire, because both want all spots, for they have been often cleanseth from sin by fire, and have suffered great martyrdom, until all the elements are turned downward. 71. The fourth digestion consummateth all the mysteries of the world, and the earth being turned into most excellent leaven, it leaveneth all imperfect bodies because it hath before passed into the heavenly nature of quintessence. 
the virtue thereof flowing from the spirit of the universe as a present panacea and universal medicine for all the diseases of all creatures. The digestions of the first work being repeated will open to thee the philosopher's secret furnace. Be right in thy works, that thou mayest find God favorable otherwise the plowing of the earth will be in vain, nor will the expected harvest e'er requite the greedy husbandman. 72. The whole progress of the philosopher's work is nothing but solution and congelation, the solution of the body, and congelation of the spirit, nevertheless there is but one operation of both, the fixed and volatile are perfectly mixed and united in the spirit. Which cannot be done unless the fixed body be first made soluble and volatile. By reduction is the volatile body fixed into a permanent body, and volatile nature doth at last change into a fixed one, as the fixed nature had before passed into volatile. Now so long as the natures were confused in the spirit, that mixed spirit keeps a middle nature between body and spirit, fixed and volatile. 73. The generation of the stone is made after the pattern of the creation of the world, for it is necessary, that it have its chaos and first matter, wherein the confused elements do fluctuate, until they be separated by the fiery spirit, they being separated, the light elements are carried upwards, and the heavy ones downwards, the light arising, darkness retreats, the waters are gathered into one place and the dry land appears. At length the two great luminaries arise, and mineral, vegetable and animal are produced in the philosopher's earth. 74. God created Adam out of the mud of the earth, wherein were inherent the virtues of all the elements of the earth and water especially, which do more constitute the sensible and corporeal heap, into this mass God breathed the breath of life, and enlivened it with the Son of the Holy Spirit. He gave Eve for a wife to Adam, and blessing them he gave unto them a precept and the faculty of multiplication. The generation of the philosopher's stone, is not unlike the creation of Adam, for the mud was made of a terrestrial and ponderous body dissolved by water, which deserved the excellent name of terra adamica, wherein all the virtues and qualities of the elements are placed. At length the heavenly soul is infused thereinto by the medium of the quintessence and solar influx, and by the benediction and dew of heaven, the virtue of multiplying ad infinitum by the intervening copulation of both sexes is given it. 75. The chief secret of this work consisteth in the manner of working, which is wholly employed about the elements, for the matter of the stone passeth from one nature into another, the elements are successively extracted, and by turns obtain dominion, everything is agitated by the circles of humidum and sicum, until all things be turned downwards, and there rest. 76. In the work of the stone the other elements are circulated in the figure of water, for the earth is resolved into water, wherein are the rest of the elements, the water is sublimated into vapor, vapor retreats into water, and so by an unwearied circle, is the water moved, until it abide fixed downwards, now that being fixed, all the elements are fixed. Thus into it they are resolved, by it they are extracted, with it they live and die, the earth is the tomb, and last end of all. 77. The order of nature requireth that every generation begin from humidum and in humidum. In the philosopher's work, nature is to be reduced into order, that so the matter of the stone which is terrestrial, compact and dry, in the first place may be dissolved and flow into the element of water next unto it, and then Saturn will be generated of Sol. 78. The air succeeds the water, drawn about by seven circles or revolutions, which is wheeled about with so many circles and reductions, until it be fixed downwards, and Saturn being expelled, Jupiter may receive the scepter and government of the kingdom, by whose coming the philosopher's infant is formed, nourished in the womb, and at length is born, resembling the splendor of Luna in her beautiful and serene countenance. 79. The fire executes the courses of the nature of the elements, extreme fire assisting it, of the hidden is made the manifest, the saffron dieth the lily, redness possesseth the cheeks of the blushing child now made stronger. A crown is prepared for him against the time of his reign. This is the consummation of the first work, and the perfect rotation of the elements the sign whereof is, when they are all terminated in sicum, 
and the body void of spirit leath down, wanting pulse, and motion, and thus all the elements are finally resolved into terror. 80. Fire placed in the stone is nature's prince, souls and an vicar, moving and digesting matter and perfecting all things therein, if it shall attain its liberty, for it leath weak under a hard bark, procure therefore its freedom that it may succor thee freely, but beware that thou urge it not above measure, for being impatient of tyranny it may become a fugitive, no hope of return being left unto thee, call it back therefore by courteous words, and keep it prudently. 81. The first mover of nature is external fire, the moderator of internal fire, and of the whole work, let the philosopher therefore very well understand the government thereof, and observe its degrees and points, for from thence the welfare or ruin of the work dependeth. Thus art helpeth nature, and the philosopher is the minister of both. 82. By these two instruments of art and nature the stone lifteth itself up from earth to heaven with great ingenuity, and slideth from heaven to earth, because the earth is its nurse, and being carried in the womb of the wind, it receiveth the force of the superiors and inferiors. 83. The circulation of the elements is performed by a double whirl, by the greater or extended and the less or contracted. The whirl extended fixeth all the elements of the earth, and its circle is not finished unless the work of sulphur be perfected. The revolution of the minor whirl is terminated by the extraction and preparation of every element. Now in this whirl there are three circles placed, which always and variously move the matter, by an erratic and intricate motion, and, often, seven times at least, drive about every element, in order succeeding one another, and so agreeable, that if one shall be wanting the labor of the rest is made void. These circulations are nature's instruments, whereby the elements are prepared. Let the philosopher therefore consider the progress of nature in the physical tract, more fully described for this very end. 84. Every circle hath its proper motion, for all the motions of the circles are conversant about the subject of humidum and sicum, and are so concatenated that they produce the one operation, and one only consent of nature, two of them are opposite, both in respect of their causes and the effects, for one moveth upwards, drying by heat, another downwards, moistening by cold, a third carrying the form of rest and sleep by digesting, induceth the cessation of both in greatest moderation. 85. Of the three circles, the first is evacuation, the labor of which is in extracting the superfluous humidum, and also in separating the pure, clean and subtle, from the gross and terrestrial dregs. Now the greatest danger is found in the motion of this circle, because it hath to do with things spiritual and makes nature plentiful. 86. Two things are chiefly to be taken heed of in moving this circle, first, that it be not moved too intensely, the other, that it be not moved for too long a time. Motion accelerated raiseth confusion in the matter, so that the gross, impure and undigested part may fly out together with the pure and subtle, and the body undissolved be mixed with the spirit, together with that which is dissolved. With this precipitated motion the heavenly and terrestrial natures are confounded, and the spirit of the quintessence, corrupted by the admixture of earth is made dull and invalid. By too long a motion the earth is too much evacuated of its spirit, and is made so languishing, dry and destitute of spirit, that it cannot easily be restored and recalled to its temperament. Either error burneth up the tincture, or turneth it into flight. 87. The second circle is restoration, whose office is to restore strength to the gasping and debilitated body by potion. The former circle was the organ of sweat and labor, but this of restoration and consolation. The action of this is employed in the grinding and mollifying the earth, potter-like, that it may be the better mixed. 88. The motion of this circle must be lighter than that of the former, especially in the beginning of its revolution, lest the crow's young ones be drowned in nest by a large flood, and the growing world be drowned by a deluge. This is the wear and assayer of measures, for it distributeth water by geometrical precepts. There is usually no greater secret found in the whole practice of the work than the firm and justly weighed motion of this circle, 
for it infirmeth the philosopher's infant and inspireth soul and life into him. 89. The laws of this circle's motions are, that it run about gently, and by little and little, and sparingly let forth itself, lest that by making haste it fail from its measure, and the fire inherent be overwhelmed with the waters, the architect of the work grow dull, or also be extinguished, that meat and drink be administered by turns, to the end there may be a better digestion made, and the best temperament of humidum, and sickum. For the indissoluble colligation of them both is the end and scope of the work. Furthermore see, that you add so much by watering, as shall be found wanting in a saying, that restoration may restore so much of the lost strength by corroborating, as evacuation hath taken away by debilitating. 90. Digestion, the last circle, acteth with silent and insensible motion, and therefore it is said by philosophers, that it is made in a secret furnace, it decocteth the nutriment received, and converteth it into the homogeneous parts of the body. Moreover, it is called putrefaction, because as meat is corrupted in the stomach before it passeth into blood and similar parts, so this operation breaketh the aliment with a concocting and stomach heat and in a manner makes it to putrefy that it may be the better fixed, and changed from a mercurial into a sulphurous nature. Again, it is called inhumation, because by it the spirit is inhumated, as a dead man buried in the ground. But because it goeth most slowly, it therefore needeth a longer time. The two former circles do labor especially in dissolving, this in congealing although all of them work in both ways. 91. The laws of this circle are, that it be moved by the feverish and most gentle heat of dung, lest that the things volatile fly out, and the spirit be troubled at the time of its strictest conjunction with the body, for then the business is perfected in the greatest tranquility and ease, therefore we must especially beware lest the earth be moved by any winds or showers. Lastly, as this third circle may always succeed the second straightways and in due order, as the second the first, so by interrupted works and by course those three erratic circles do complete one entire circulation, which often reiterated doth at length turn all things into earth, and makes similarity between opposites. 92. Nature useth fire, so also doth art after its example, as an instrument, and mallet in cutting out its works. In both operations therefore fire is master and perfecter. Wherefore the knowledge of fire is most necessary for a philosopher, without which as another Ixion, condemned to labor in vain, he shall turn about the whirl of nature to no purpose. 93. The name fire is equivocal amongst philosophers, for sometimes it is used by metonymy for heat, and so there be as many fires as heats. In the generation of metals and vegetables nature acknowledgeth the threefold fire, to wit, celestial, terrestrial, and innate. The first flows from sol as its fountain into the bosom of the earth, it stirreth up fumes, or mercurial and sulphurous vapors of which the metals are created, and mixeth itself amongst them, it stirreth up that torpid fire which is placed in the seeds of vegetables, and addeth fresh sparks unto it, as a spur to vegetation. The second lurketh in the bowels of the earth, by the impulse and action whereof the subterraneous vapors are driven upwards as through pores and pipes, and thrusts outwards from the center towards the surface of the earth, both for the composition of metals, where the earth swelleth up, as also for the production of vegetables, by putrefying their seeds, by softening and preparing them for generation. The third fire, viz., innate is also indeed solar, it is generated of a vapid smoke of metals, and also being infused with the monthly provision grows together with the humid matter, and is retained as in a prison, or more truly, as form is conjoined with the mixed body, it firmly inhereth in the seeds of vegetables, until being solicited by the point of its father's rays it be called out, then motion intrinsically moveth and infameth the matter, and becomes the moulder and dispenser of the whole mixture. In the generation of animals, celestial fire doth insensibly cooperate with the animal, for it is the first agent in nature, for the heat of the female answereth to terrestrial fire, when the seed putrefies, this warmth prepareth it. For truly the fire is implanted in the seed, then the son of Sol disposeth of the matter, and being disposed, he infameth it. 94. 
Philosophers have observed a threefold fire in the matter of their work, natural, unnatural, and contra-natural. The natural they call the fiery celestial spirit innate, kept in the profundity of matter, and most strictly bound unto it, which by the sluggish strength of metal grows dull, until being stirred up and freed by the philosopher's discretion and external heat, it shall have obtained a faculty of moving its body dissolved, and so it may inform its humid matter, by unfolding penetration, dilatation, and congelation. In every mixed body natural fire is the principle of heat and motion. Unnatural fire they name that which being procured and coming from without is introduced into the matter artificially, that it may increase and multiply the strength of the natural heat. The fire contrary to nature they call that which putrefieth the compositum, and corrupteth the temperament of nature. It is imperfect, because being too weak for generation, it is not carried beyond the bounds of corruption, such is the fire or heat of the menstruum, yet it hath the name improperly of fire against nature, because in a manner it is according to nature, for although it destroys the specific form, and corrupteth the matter, yet it disposeth it for reproduction. 95. It is more credible nevertheless that the corrupting fire, called fire against nature, is not different from the innate, but the first degree of it, for the order of nature requireth, that corruption should precede generation, the fire therefore that is innate, agreeable to the law of nature, performeth both, by exciting both successively in the matter, the first of corruption more gentle stirred up, by feeble heat to mollify and prepare the body, the other of generation more forcible, moved by a more vehement heat, to animate and fully inform the elementary body disposed of by the former. A double motion doth therefore proceed from a double degree of heat of the same fire, neither is it to be accounted a double fire, for far better may the name of fire contrary to nature be given to violent, and destructive fire. 96. Unnatural fire is converted into natural or innate fire by successive degrees of digestion, and increaseth and multiplieth it. Now the whole secret consisteth in the multiplication of natural fire, which of itself is not able to work above its proper strength, nor communicate a perfect, tincture to imperfect bodies, for although it be sufficient to itself, yet hath it not any further power, but being multiplied by the unnatural, which most aboundeth with the virtue of multiplying doth act far more powerfully, and reacheth itself beyond the bounds of nature colouring strange and imperfect bodies, and perfecting them, because of its plentiful tincture, and the abstruse treasure of multiplied fire. 97. Philosophers call their water, fire, because it is most hot, and endued with a fiery spirit, again water is called fire by them, because it burneth the bodies of perfect metals more than common fire doth for it perfectly dissolveth them, whereas they resist our fire, and will not suffer themselves to be dissolved by it, for this cause it is also called burning water. Now that fire of tincture is hid in the belly of the water and manifests itself by a double effect, viz., of the body's solution and multiplication. 98. Nature useth a double fire in the work of generation, intrinsic and extrinsic, the former being placed in the seeds and mixtures of things, is hid in their center, and as a principle of motion and life doth move and quicken the body. But the latter, extrinsic, whether it be poured down from heaven or earth, raiseth the former, as drowned with sleep, and compels it to action, for the vital sparks implanted in the seeds stand in need of an external motor, that they may be moved and act. 99. It is even so in the philosopher's work, for the matter of the stone possesseth his interior fire, which is partly innate, partly also is added by the philosopher's art, for those are united and come inward together, because they are homogeneous, the internal standeth in need of the external, which the philosopher administereth according to the precepts of art and nature, this compelleth the former to move. These fires are as two wheels, whereof the hidden one being moved by the visible one, it is moved sooner or later, and thus art helpeth nature. 100. The internal fire is the middle agent between the motor and the matter, whence it is, that as it is moved by that, it moveth this, and if so be it shall be driven intensely or remissly, it will work after the same manner in the matter. The information of the whole work dependeth of the measure of external fire. 101. 
He that is ignorant of the degrees and points of external fire, let him not start upon the philosophical work, for he will never obtain light out of darkness, unless the heats pass through their middle stages, like the elements, whose extremes are not converted, but only their means. 102. Because the whole work consisteth in separation and perfect preparation of the four elements, therefore so many grades of fire are necessary thereunto, for every element is extracted by the degree of fire proper to it. 103. The four grades of heat are called the heat of the water bath, the heat of ashes, of coals, and of flame, which is also called optetic, every grade hath its degrees, two at least, sometimes three, for heat is to be moved slowly and by degrees, whether it be increased or decreased, so that matter, after nature's example, may go on by degrees and willingly unto formation and completion, for nothing is so strange to nature as that which is violent. Let the philosopher propound for his consideration the gentle access and recess of the sun, whose light and lamp bestoweth its heat to the things of the world, according to the times and laws of the universe, and so bestoweth a certain temperament upon them. 104. The first degree of the bath of heat is called the heat of a fever, the second of dung. The first degree of the second grade is the simple heat of ashes, the second is the heat of sand. Now the degrees of fire, coals and flame want a proper name, but they are distinguished by the operation of the intellect, according to their intensity. 105. Three grades only of fire are sometimes found amongst philosophers, viz. the water bath, of ashes and of flame, which latter comprehendeth the fire of coals and of flame, the heat of dung is sometimes distinguished from the heat of the bath in degree. Thus for the most part authors do involve the light in darkness, by the various expressions of the philosopher's fire, for the knowledge thereof is accounted amongst their chief secrets. 106. In the white work, because three elements only are extracted, three degrees of fire do suffice, the last, to wit the optetic, is reserved for the fourth element, which finisheth the red work. By the first degree the eclipse of Sol and Luna is made, by the second the light of Luna begins to be restored, by the third Luna attaineth unto the fullness of her splendor, and by the fourth Sol is exalted into the highest apex of his glory. Now in every part the fire is administered according to the rules of geometry, so that the agent may answer to the disposition of the patient, and their strength be equally poised betwixt themselves. 107. Philosophers have very much insisted upon secrecy in regard to their fire, they scarce have been bold to describe it but show it rather by a description of its qualities and properties, than by its name, as that it is called airy fire, vaporous, humid, and dry, clear or star-like, because it may easily by degrees be increased or remitted as the artificer pleaseth. He that desireth more of the knowledge of fire may be satisfied by the works of Lullius, who hath opened the secrets of practice to worthy minds candidly. 108. Of the conflict of the eagle and the lion also they write diversely, because the lion is the strongest animal, and therefore it is necessary that more eagles act together, three at least, or more, even to ten, to conquer him, the fewer they are, the greater the contention, and the slower the victory, but the more eagles, the shorter the battle, and the plundering of the lion will more readily follow. The happier number of seven eagles may be taken out of Lullius, or of nine out of Senior. 109. The vessel wherein philosophers decoct their work is twofold, the one of nature, the other of art, the vessel of nature which is also called the vessel of philosophy is the earth of the stone, or the female or matrix, whereinto the sperm of the male is received putrefies, and is prepared for generation, the vessel of nature is of three sorts, for the secret is decocted in a threefold vessel. 110. The first vessel is made of a transparent stone, or of a stony glass, the form thereof some philosophers have hid by a certain enigmatic description, sometimes affirming that it is compounded of two pieces, to wit, an alembic and a bolt head, sometimes of three at other times of the two former with the addition of a cover. 111. 
Many have feigned the multiply of such like vessels to be necessary to the philosophical work, calling them by divers names with a desire of hiding the secret by a diversity of operations, for they call it dissolvent of solutions, putrefactory for putrefaction, distillatory for distillation, sublimatory for sublimation, calcinatory for calcination and c. 112. But all deceit being removed we may speak sincerely, one only vessel of art sufficeth to terminate the work of either sulphur, and another for the work of the elixir, for the diversity of digestions requireth not the change of vessels, yea we must have a care lest the vessel be changed or opened before the first work be ended. 113. You shall choose a form of glass vessel round in the bottom, or cucurbit, or at least oval, the neck a hand's breadth long or more, large enough with a straight mouth made like a pitcher or jug, continuous and unbroken and equally thick in every part, that it may resist a long, and sometimes an acute fire the cucurbit is called a blind head because its eye is blinded with the hermetic seal, lest anything from without should enter in, or the spirit steal out. 114. The second vessel of art may be of wood, of the trunk of an oak, cut into two hollow hemispheres, wherein the philosopher's egg may be cherished till it be hatched, of which see the fountain of Trevisan. 115. The third vessel practitioners have called their furnace, which keeps the other vessels with the matter and the whole work, this also philosophers have endeavoured to hide amongst their secrets. 116. The furnace which is the keeper of secrets, is called Athenor, from the immortal fire, which it always preserveth, for although it afford unto the work continual fire, yet sometimes unequally, which reason requireth to be administered more or less according to the quantity of matter, and the capacity of the furnace. 117. The matter of the furnace is made of brick, or of daubed earth, or of potter's clay well beaten and prepared with horse dung, mixed with hair, so that it may cohere the firmer, and may not be cracked by long heating, let the walls be three or four fingers thick, to the end that the furnace may be the better able to keep in the heat and withstand it. 118. Let the form of the furnace be round, the inward altitude of two feet or thereabouts, in the midst whereof an iron or brazen plate must be set, of a round figure, about the thickness of a penknife's back, in a manner possessing the interior latitude of the furnace, but a little narrower than it, lest it touch the walls, it must lean upon three or four props of iron fixed to the walls, and let it be full of holes, that the heat may be the more easily carried upwards by them, and between the sides of the furnace and the plate. Below the plate let there be a little door left, and another above in the walls of the furnace, that by the lower the fire may be put in, and by the higher the temperament of the heat may be sensibly perceived, at the opposite part whereof let there be a little window of the figure of a rhomboid fortified with glass, that the light over against it may show the colours to the eye. Upon the middle of the aforesaid plate, let the tripod of secrets be placed with a double vessel. Lastly, let the furnace be very well covered with a shell or covering agreeable unto it, and take care that the little doors be always closely shut, lest the heat escape. 119. Thus thou hast all things necessary to the first work, the end whereof is the generation of two sorts of sulphur, the composition and perfection of both may be thus finished. The practice of the sulphur dot take. A red dragon, courageous, warlike, to whom no natural strength is wanting, and afterwards seven or nine noble eagles, virgins, whose eyes will not wax dull by the rays of the sun, cast the birds with the beast into a clear prison and strongly shut them up, under this let a bath be placed, that they may be incensed to fight by the warmth, in a short time they will enter into a long and harsh contention, until at length about the forty-fifth day or the fiftieth the eagles begin to prey upon and tear the beast to pieces, which dying will infect the whole prison with its black and direful poison, whereby the eagles being wounded, they will also be constrained to give up the ghost. From the putrefaction of the dead carcasses a crow will be generated, which by little and little will put forth its head, and the heat being somewhat increased it will forthwith stretch forth its wings and begin to fly, but seeking chinks from the winds and clouds, it will long hover about, take heed that it find not any chinks. 
at length being made white by a gentle and long rain, and with the dew of heaven it will be changed into a white swan, but the newborn crow is a sign of the departed dragon. In making the crow white, extract the elements, and distill them according to the order prescribed, until they be fixed in their earth, and end in snow-like and most subtle dust, which being finished thou shalt enjoy thy first desire, the white work. 120. If thou intendest to proceed further to the red, add the element of fire, which is not needed for the white work, the vessel therefore being fixed, and the fire strengthened by little and little through its grades, force the matter until the occult begin to be made manifest, the sign whereof will be the orange color arising, raise the fire to the fourth degree by its degrees, until by the help of Vulcan, purple roses be generated from the lily, and lastly the amaranth died with the dark redness of blood. But thou mayest not cease to bring out fire by fire, until thou shalt behold the matter terminated in most red ashes, imperceptible to the touch. This red stone may rear up thy mind to greater things, by the blessing and assistance of the Holy Trinity. 121. They that think they have brought their work to an end by perfect sulphur, not knowing nature or art, and to have fulfilled the precepts of the secret are much deceived, and will try projection in vain, for the praxis of the stone is perfected by a double work, the first is the creation of the sulphur, the second is the making of the elixir. 122. The aforesaid philosopher's sulphur is most subtle earth, most hot and dry, in the belly where of the fire of nature abundantly multiplied is hidden. Therefore it deserveth the name of the fire of the stone, for it hath in itself the virtue of opening and penetrating the bodies of metals, and of turning them into its own temperament and producing its like, wherefore it is called a father and masculine seed. 123. That we may leave nothing untouched, let the students in philosophy know that from that first sulphur, a second is generated which may be multiplied ad infinitum, let the wise man, after he hath got the everlasting mineral of that heavenly fire, keep it diligently. Now of what matter sulphur is generated, of the same it is multiplied, a small portion of the first being added, yet as in the balance. The rest, a tyro may see in Lullius, it may suffice only to point to this. 124. The elixir is compounded of a threefold matter, namely, of metallic water or mercury sublimated as before, of leaven white or red, according to the intention of the operator, and of the second sulphur, all by weight. 125. There are five proper and necessary qualities in the perfect elixir, that it be fusible, permanent, penetrating, tincturing, and multiplying. It borroweth its tincture and fixation from the leaven, its penetration from the sulphur, its fusion from argent vive, which is the medium of conjoining tinctures, to wit of the ferment and sulphur, and its multiplicative virtue, from the spirit infused into the quintessence. 126. Two perfect metals give a perfect tincture, because they are dyed with the pure sulphur of nature, and therefore no ferment of metals may be sought except these two bodies, therefore dye thy elixir white and red with luna and sol, mercury first of all receives their tincture, and having received it, doth communicate it to others. 127. In compounding the elixir take heed you change not or mix anything with the ferments, for either elixir must have its proper ferment, and desireth its proper elements, for it is provided by nature that the two luminaries have their different sulphurs and distinct tinctures. 128. The second work is concocted as the first, in the same or a like vessel, the same furnace, and by the same degrees of fire, but is perfected in a shorter time. 129. There are three humors in the stone, which are to be extracted successively, namely, watery, airy, and radical, and therefore all the labor and care of the workman is employed about the humor, neither is any other element in the work of the stone circulated beside the humid one. For it is necessary, in the first place, that the earth be resolved and melted into humor. Now the radical humor of all things, accounted fire, is most tenacious, because it is tied to the center of nature, from which it is not easily separated, extract, 
therefore, these three humors slowly and successively, dissolving and congealing them by their whirls, for by the multiplied alternative reiteration of solution and congelation the whirl, is extended and the whole work finished. 130. The elixir's perfection consisteth in the strict union and indissoluble matrimony of sicum and humidum, so that they may not be separated, but the sicum may flow with moderate heat into the humidum, abiding every pressure of fire. The sign of perfection is that if a very little of it be cast in above the iron or brazen plate while very hot, it flow forthwith without smoke. Let three weights of red earth or of red ferment, and a double weight of water and air well ground up be mixed together. Let an amalgama be made like butter, or metalline paste, so that the earth being mollified may be insensible to the touch. Add one weight and a half of fire, let these be transferred to the vessel and exposed to a fire of the first degree, most closely sealed, afterwards let the elements be extracted out of their degrees of fire in their order, which being turned downwards with a gentle motion they may be fixed in their earth, so as nothing volatile may be raised up from thence, the matter at length shall be terminated in a stone, illuminated, red and diaphanous, a part whereof take at pleasure and having cast it into a crucible with a little fire by drops give it to drink its red oil and inserate it, until it be quite melted, and to flow without smoke. Nor mayst thou fear its flight, for the earth being mollified with the sweetness of the potion will retain it, having received it, within its bowels, then take the elixir thus perfected into thine own power and keep it carefully. In God rejoice, and be silent. 132. The order and method of composing and perfecting the white elixir is the same, so that thou usest the white elements only in the composition thereof, but the body of it brought to the term of decoction will end in the plate, white, splendid, and crystal-like, which inserated with its white oil will be fused. Cast one weight of either elixir, upon ten times its weight of argent vive well washed and thou wilt admire its effect with astonishment. 133. Because in the elixir the strength of natural fire is most abundantly multiplied by the spirit infused into the quintessence, and the depraved accidents of bodies, which beset their purity and the true light of nature with darkness, are taken away by long and manifold sublimations and digestions, therefore fiery nature freed from its fetters and fortified with the aid of heavenly strength, works most powerfully, being included in this our fifth element, let it not therefore be a wonder if it obtain strength not only to perfect imperfect things, but also to multiply its force and power. Now the fountain of multiplication is in the prince of the luminaries, who by the infinite multiplication of his beams begetteth all things in this our orb, and multiplieth things generated by infusing a multiplicative virtue into the seeds of things. 134. The way of multiplying the elixir is threefold, by the first, ah, mingle one weight of red elixir, with nine times its weight of red water, and dissolve it into water in a vessel suitable for solution, the matter being well dissolved and united coagulated by decoction with a gentle fire, until it be made strong into a ruby or red lamel, which afterwards inserate with its red oil, after the manner prescribed until it melt and flow, so shalt thou have a medicine ten times more powerful than the first. The business is easily finished in a short time. 135. By the second manner. Ah, what portion thou pleasest of thy elixir mixed with its water, the weights being observed, seal it very well in the vessel of reduction, dissolve it in a bath, by inhumation, being dissolved, distill it separating the elements by their proper degrees of fire, and fixing them downwards, as was done in the first and second work, until it become a stone, lastly, enserate it and project it. This is the longer, but yet the richer way, for the virtue of the elixir is increased even an hundredfold, for by how much the more subtle it is made by reiterated operations, so much more both of superior and inferior strength it retaineth, and more powerfully operateth. 136. Lastly, take one ounce of the said elixir multiplied in virtue and project it upon an hundred of purified mercury, and in a little time the mercury made hot amongst burning coals will be converted into pure elixir, whereof if thou castest every ounce upon another hundred of the like mercury, 
soul will shine most purely to thine eyes. The multiplication of white elixir may be made in the same way. Study the virtues of this medicine to cure all kinds of diseases, and to preserve good health, as also other uses thereof, out of the writings of Arnold of Villanova, Lullius and of other philosophers. 137. The significator of the philosopher will instruct him concerning the times of the stone, for the first work at album must be terminated in the house of Luna, the second, in the second house of Mercury. The first work at Rubium, will end in the second house of Venus, and the last in the other regal throne of Jupiter, from whence our most potent king shall receive a crown decked with most precious rubies. Thus doth the winding of the circling year trace its own footsteps, and the same appear. 138. A three-headed dragon keepeth this golden fleece, the first head proceedeth from the waters, the second from the earth, the third from the air, it is necessary that these three heads do end in one most potent, which will devour all the other dragons, then a way is laid open for thee to the golden fleece. Farewell. Diligent reader, in reading these things invocate the spirit of eternal light, speak little, meditate much, and judge aright. The Times of the Stone. The Interpretation of the Philosopher's Significator. To every planet two houses were assigned by the ancients, Sol and Loon accepted, whereof the planet Saturn hath his two houses adjoining. Philosophers in handling their philosophical work, begin their years in winter, to wit, the sun being in Capricorn, which is the former house of Saturn, and so come towards the right hand. In the second place the other house of Saturn is found in Aquarius, at which time Saturn, i.e., the blackness of the work of the magistery begins after the forty-fifth or fiftieth day. Sol coming into Pisces the work is black, blacker than black, and the head of the crow begins to appear. The third month being ended, and Sol entering into Aries, the sublimation or separation of the elements begin. Those which follow unto Cancer make the work white, Cancer addeth the greatest whiteness and splendor, and doth perfectly fill up all the days of the stone, or white sulfur, or the lunar work of sulfur, lunar sitting and reigning gloriously in her house, in Leo, the regal mansion of the sun, the solar work begins, which in Libra is terminated into a ruby stone or perfect sulphur. The two signs Scorpio and Sagittarius which remain are required for the completing of the elixir. And thus the philosopher's admirable offspring taketh its beginning in the reign of Saturn, and its end and perfection in the dominion of Jupiter.